Hello and welcome to the debrief for uh there's no so again, if you mess something up, we record it. We <laughs> right, can edit yes, we can it. always we can edit. It's not live. This is the Thursday you show. You all messing me up. Right. <laughs> all right. One more time. Check one, two, three. The deep. Three. Three. Yeah. This is the deep. Three. Go. Your guide to Detroit. Your guide to Detroit's art. Arts and entertainment scene. This is the deep. Three. Hello and welcome to The Debrief. I am your co-host. My name is Seth Ressler. I'm Becky Scarcello. And I'm Jag. All right, guys. I've been telling you about this guy for a while now. Oh, yeah. I, I know. You sure I know. have. <laughs> you, have yeah. a, you, you have talked uh, so highly of our guest. I'm excited to finally meet him. I know. You have a man crush on him. Uh, look. You literally have a man. You do. It's okay. Look, we, it's okay. We, we've explained it. You know the feeling know. when you see a band that is oh. very small, up and coming, yes. and you watch them grow over the years, and you're like, that. It's one th- of my favorite That's going to be things. a star. Yes. I'm telling you, this guy, I think is going to be a star. We're talking about him like he's not here. He's oh, right no. here with us no, in the studio. But no, look at the halo around. <laughs> like and the, the hearts around the, Seth's the head. Glow. Right. No pressure. Uh, <laughs> we have a comedian with us. His name is Jeff Horst. Uh, first of all, he was on Kevin Hart last year. They, Kevin Hart goes uh, hard to the city, goes from city to city to city, picks a handful of local comedians and has them best on. Best of the best. He was one of the four. Now, Kevin Hart has picked him again to be on uh, Kevin Hart Presents The Next Level, which is going to be be this Friday night at 11. So tomorrow night. Tomorrow. Central. Yes. That's yes. Ex- so exciting. Uh, Congratulations. And, 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 thank so you. Jeff, thank you for joining us. I'm Thanks glad you're finally here. Me. No pressure. I hope I didn't set the... <laughs> <laughs> uh, hey. Oversell. <laughs> right. <laughs> I want to point out that you also uh, just headlined Mark Ridley's Comedy Castle not too long ago. Was that that yes. show? Yes. Uh, and you're headlining the Motor City Comedy Festival with the Motown Kings. The yeah. Motown Laugh Kings, yeah. right? Yeah. Yeah. Ron Taylor, Darius Bennett, Josh Adams. We haven't, you know, all performed together in a while obviously since uh ron and darius uh currently live in la um so it's going to be excited you know not to hang out with them because they're friends of mine but to perform with them and to have us all in one show again so let's talk about this kevin hart experience because you've now <laughs> recorded two shows for yeah. him uh tell us how that first happened and what it was like to go out there and film all of this yeah well uh first it happened obviously from the the first show uh heart of the city uh, there was a showcase in Detroit uh, once a week throughout the course of like four weeks. They had uh, several, you know, they had probably as many as like 15, 20 comedians uh, packed onto every show. And uh, I just had a very good uh, set on, on the one that I did. Um, they taped all the shows. They sent it to, you know, Kevin Hart's team. And then they watched, you know, they watched all of the uh, performers. Um, and uh, so I was lucky to be chosen to be on that. And then so from that, I did well on the actual taping of Heart of the City. And that's when they uh, picked me to do the, the half hour uh, special for, so uh, for the next level. Who calls you for that? Like, yeah. Is that actually Kevin? Like your phone no. Rings? <laughs> <laughs> no, there's, uh, there, there, he has a team of people that like help him throughout like each step of the process. So there was a lady that called me. And uh, it was weird, the phone call, because I actually messaged somebody from uh, that I knew. There's a guy named David Perdue who did the first season. He's from Atlanta. And uh, I was asking him, I was like, did a lady, when you did this show, did a lady ask you your social over the phone and give very little information? <laughs> uh, I was like, because, I mean, I've given my social out before, like, for college to get a credit card to get a free Domino's pizza. So it's like, I, in the back of my mind, I'm like, I'm not, like, overly worried. I just would be more excited if I knew this was a real thing. Legit. And he's like, yeah, this is legit. It's, you know, they got to get the paperwork going. So... Wow. Uh, yeah, it was crazy to get that phone call, and um, and even crazier, you know, I'm somebody sometimes where I push off my emotions until it's like, uh, uh, it it actually happens. I don't really get too nervous until if it's too far away. I can't even I can't get nervous about it. I can't think about it. It's too far away. So uh, definitely, the day that it happened was a crazy experience for me. And then then uh, flying out to L.A. Uh, was where they shot the the half hour special, uh, and that was at the Orpheum Theater in L.A. Oh wow! And, and what actually wow. happens? Yeah. I mean, who's the audience? Are you actually just performing half an hour, or are they editing yeah. it down? Yeah, yeah, no, the uh, or yeah, it, it's a it's it's, it, it's a half hour, and then I'm sure they'll edit it down to like twenty minutes, uh, and then two minutes, maybe one to two minutes of the interview between me and Kevin Hart. Uh, so they'll they'll show it in a way to where they'll it'll start off with uh, the interviews. 
um, the, the interview with me and Kevin Hart, and then it'll go right into the special. Um, and uh, yeah, yeah, just the the entire experience was crazy. You know, you you, you think that you're pre- you, you can be prepared for the comedy, but all the stuff around it are things that you're not prepared for. Like uh, just experiencing the. Well, they asked me for a rider, and I'm like, well, "What do you mean? You got? I'm sure you got bottles of water and stuff. Like, what do you? Oh, <laughs> like, you, got, you don't no, want to? You, need you don't want to be the? You know, I don't want to be a diva about it. Oh, you know what green I mean? So I'm just you like, gotta do did the you whole like thing. come up with stuff just so you could have an actual rider? Like, so I, I guess it'd be nice. The to things have this I asked stuff. for, I'm, I, I think afterwards I found out. Yeah, they were just gonna give that to everybody. tray, and they're like, "Well, yeah, everybody gets a veggie tray. You know what I mean? Like, that's just that's how they say hello. They give you a veggie tray. Those are just there, just carrots getting stale, just." But, you know they got they got them for days yeah. and uh, I just of my paranoia of trying to overplan I was like well what if I was sick that day I'd want some tea you know so I asked mm. for tea and they gave me more tea than anybody could want for one day and uh, wow. <laughs> and uh, so I had like a little teapot and everything like that but um I, I have yeah. to imagine that one of the things that's different when you're performing for something like this is that there's actually television cameras. Do you have to block? Do you know where the cameras are? Yes, Do that they was, give you instructions? Yes. Yeah, so uh, it was It was all – the whole thing was shot from a Thursday through a Saturday where Thursday was the interviews with Kevin Hart and, and, and in, in each of the comics, and there were six of us total, and three of us uh, did a show on, uh, on a Friday, and three of us did a show on a Saturday. And originally the blocking was supposed to take place on Thursday after the interviews, but because of some technical technical difficulties with the the you know just everything in production <laughs> that uh, I'm, I'm sure is bound to happen at times the interviews took a little bit a lot longer than they expected so we actually came in a few hours earlier on Friday to do all the blocking and this is where you set the mic stand and uh, do you do any physical jokes we need to know how far we can prepare to for the cameras to go to look out for you and uh, and, th- and then you just feel silly hmm. because I I don't have too much physical humor, so to me, I'm like, I don't know. I have a joke about an awkward story of you know me in a bathroom, and I'm, and I'm just like grabbing toilet. Paper. I'm just like reaching my hand like thirty times, and them just in a, on the stage with an empty theater, just practicing. Yeah. So they're just like, yeah, <laughs> we just want to see you reaching. We just want to see you reaching. All right, that's it. And it's, it just felt it just, the blocking part felt really awkward, especially because I'm not the. You know, I, I, I definitely like I'm the I'm the token white guy like on you know in the season and and that shows just like in my mannerisms like I'm not going out going all woo woo like I'm like other people that's their personality it fits them that's great and uh, I'm sitting there like I don't know do I do the little the boom boom the gun finger do guns do, do I do the finger guns do I do do I wave I don't I don't know yeah uh, it's you know that's <laughs> <laughs> so, Jeff, when you're when you're up there in the moment doing it, is that you, you're obviously ha- your brain is used to a certain routine and muscle memory doing your routine. Yes. And then is that messy because you've got to also remember, okay, camera over here, I got to move this way. No, they had so many cameras that they mm-hmm. were like, the cameras are going to yes. find you. So I didn't okay. have to worry about the cameras. They had they had like a floating camera that was kind of getting like an overview. Did like they have a drone shot? Was there a drone? Uh, I don't think there was a drone. <laughs> okay. uh, they they uh, yeah they had they had. A lot of cameras, so that wasn't really the the concern. But the blocking was to like make sure there were specific specific angles that they wanted for the promo and for different uh, aspects of the show that they're planning for that they want to make sure that they get. And so they the background they were changing colors to like kind of match with whatever shirt you're wearing and stuff like that. Um, you spent so, a lot of time thinking about what you were going to wear. Uh, I didn't st- put any time because really? they had a team for it. So oh, they, was, they had so a they were, wow. they were like, team for you. Yeah, so they had they were like uh, bring three to five outfits, and then uh, give us your measurements in between what you bring and what we bring for you. Wow, uh, we'll find something uh, together. Huh. And other people that have way more fashion sense than me, all the other comics on the show, they you know they have good shoes. They have. I was the only comic that went home with a new pair of shoes. <laughs> <laughs> like everybody else was like, oh, those shoes you bought that'll work for TV. And me, they were like. Uh, let's find you something. Yeah. Let's find you something. Let's How do these? And I'm like, it's my first time wearing shoes that I don't feel comfortable in. I'm not used to the tiptoeing around, don't get them dirty, cleaning yeah. them the day I, you go home. I got to clean these shoes now. Oh, like fine. that's just a weird. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Them them fitting me is a, it taught me so many things that I didn't know. Like I thought I knew how to dress myself. <laughs> and it, I thought I did. And then I, I I grew up thinking that slim fit were skinny jeans. I thought that's what those were. Oh no. I thought that. I I didn't know that skinny was its own fit. Yes. I thought that I thought that that's just the nickname For that slim. they gave 
that they gave the the slim fitting jeans. Uh -huh. And then I was so that was my first time wearing those. I actually went like a size bigger, uh, it, uh, a, and but in a in a smaller fit. And I was right, like, right. oh wow. You know, Becky, great. Becky can hook you up with a wardrobe <laughs> designer because you've got oh, one from yeah, the Detroit stylist. Music Awards. Yeah, yes. she can, she can yeah. connect you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and the, mm -hmm. the guy was like, you look 50, you know, oh, yeah, those those are 15 pounds lighter. And I was like, oh, wow, thank no, you. Oh, and meanwhile, nice. my, my girlfriend uh, was there with me, uh, Esther, and she's a comedian as well. Yes. And she uh, she's like, I've been telling him that for years. I'm like, it's not your job. <laughs> right. It's not your job, though. You know what I mean? You like, didn't you, you, believe you, it. You're yeah. an audio engineer. When you talk about audio, I, I believe you. And when you talk about, you know, other Slim stuff. It depends. <laughs> it depends on the credibility of the situation. So you know, I was going to ask you that. So I saw Esther open for Michael Che. Oh, oh okay. Show. It was amazing. Yeah. yeah, she did a great job. So I was wondering what it's like two comedians, you know, dating each other. Like how, uh, you know, yeah, do you, I, you can I, commiserate about the business. You can, t you yeah, know, a lot in common, I, I, but. A lot of people say that they can never date a comedian. I could never date somebody who is not a comedian. Really? Because I would just, I don't think a non-comedian understands that your family with your Thanksgiving is not more important than any show that I do. <laughs> like, like oh. it's, my job takes place at night. And if it's yeah. easy for somebody whose job doesn't take place at night to say, oh, I make time for your things. When I'm like, but it, I'm sorry. It's just you're, if you're done at five o'clock and my job starts at eight, you'll never have, you know, in a, reg, in a different relationship, there would never be a situation where she would have to cancel something for me because her job is, during, I just, right. I just don't mm -hmm. know how I would feel like a jerk in being, a different being scenario. Being the guy that couldn't make stuff happen. Yeah, yeah. To, to, to just where somebody could book you, plans can cancel, you can get a last minute email. Like when she opened up for Michael Shea, she was originally going to come, that was the same weekend I was headlining at Mark Ridley's. Right. Oh. And so she was originally going to, she's seen me perform before, so it's not yeah, like, yeah. I'm not like <laughs> She knows, she knows your jokes. That, she knows I'm not staffing. sad that she had to miss it or anything. You know, I was obviously beyond happy that she got to do it, but yeah. that was the original plan was she was going to come to see my show on Friday and she's like, well, I'm not, I'm going to open up for Michael Shea. You're like, so I was oh, like, okay. all right, well, wait, Absolutely. upstage me, but all right. You say upstage jokingly, of course, but <laughs> yes. is there is yes. there any is there any friendly competition between the two of you? Like yeah, and your careers. Not which we, we're just happy. I hear that in other relationships, so maybe it, de it depends on the person. But anytime she gets any opportunity, I'm just well, no, I don't, I don't mean in terms. I don't mean in terms of your career success, but I mean just ripping jokes like. Oh yeah, in we the make house. fun of each other all the time. Yeah. Because like for me, yeah. and, and I am by as these two will tell you, I am by no means a comedian. But you yeah. know, but I crack a lot of jokes just from being a radio DJ. And yeah. like, and my wife is more more laid back and about stuff, and mm -hmm. I'm the one that cracks the jokes at the time. And like, my wife has a couple friends that make her laugh more than I do, uh, and I'm kind of jealous of them because they <laughs> oh, can get her yes. laugh more than I can. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, we definitely probably make each other laugh more than anybody else that we we know. We we have a similar sense of humor, and so we, we yeah we make fun of each. Plus, you have the all the inside jokes that every couple has. Yeah, yeah on top. Sure, yeah, sure. yeah, yeah, exactly. You know, you mentioned being the token white guy in this season of uh, yeah. uh, the next level. I want to ask you about that because race is a topic that you talk about mm -hmm. in your act on stage, and you are one of the the few white comedians I've seen who can play a black room. You can play a white room. You can play uh -huh. a mixed room. I, I mean, talk about your take on race uh, and, and how it plays a role in your comedy. Well, for me, it, it plays race. It, it plays a role in my comedy because of like how I grew up. So I grew up uh, like Eight Mile in Evergreen. Mm -hmm. I grew up in Southfield. I went to Southfield schools my whole life, and I was like amongst my friends. I had some white friends, but it was nine out of ten. It, it was you know everybody was black. That was my group of friends. Was I was the token white kid amongst a group of black friends, and. So I think that I just had more of a sense of humor from that perspective instead of where a lot of, you know, the average white guy in America, their perspective is, you know, if, if, if everybody in your, if you have one black friend, then that's going to be your perspective <laughs> right, of black culture right. is that one black friend of yours. Right. <laughs> where, so for me, I actually felt more comfortable in the black rooms than the white rooms. Uh, it took a while to, for me to feel just as comfortable in any situation. Uh, where in the beginning there was a couple of years where I was like, yeah, I, white people they don't laugh. Did you know that? <laughs> that? They just don't. White people don't laugh when you say jokes. That yeah. was my. So, so did your material change or does your act change depending on the audience you're playing for? My, not. I, I, I guess I'd like to say that my my jokes might change, but I don't like. Uh, I don't have like a different perspective. I don't have like a different tone, or it's just in my head. I know that there's certain things that 
you know, maybe the average white person doesn't know about, or they might, it might, or might make them uncomfortable, one or the other. Mm-hmm. Right. So white people not might not know as much about FUBU. As, oh, right. you know, <laughs> like there's certain references that white people They're might not, not get. get it. And yeah. then on top of that, if I do start to get into, you know, more, uh, more of the political aspect of things, if I, you know, white people, sometimes them thinking about white privilege, uh, I didn't, there was a comedian who brought this to my attention when after a show, I was wondering, you know, kind of what, what went wrong. <laughs> mm-hmm. And then I vented with uh, Robert Jenkins mm-hmm. and he's a really good uh, local comic uh, from Lansing, uh, the Lansing area. And he was like, well, Jeff, you make white people wonder why they don't care. They're like, well, this white guy seems to care so uh, much about other cultures. How come I don't care? So then they oh, just feel, feel guilty. Bad about they, they're feeling guilty about, and uh, I never really thought of that, you mm-hmm. know, where that is a, a race does play a big role in my comedy because there, there was one time somebody put it after a show, a white guy came up to me and said, I just don't know, why do you care so much? And then I was like, oh, wow. I never thought that people, I, I never thought of it from the perspective of people think that you can only care about whatever it is you look like. Mm-hmm. Men care about men, women care about women. Like that's the, and to me, I'm like, well, you know, oh, breast cancer mm-hmm. affects women <laughs> 99% of the time. That's still something an awful thing. About. It's still yeah. something right. I care about. Right. You know yeah. what I mean? So I guess I just, uh, have, I've kind of viewed things differently from my upbringing and that's kind of been reflective on my comedy as well. And it's, Luckily, I'm glad that I stuck to it uh, because, you know, I'm sure on paper people assume that most of the opportunities are in the white rooms. White people are the majority uh, of the percentage of of the makeup of this country. So why would you tailor it? to? But for me, that's being myself has led me to more opportunities than trying to please people that uh, isn't necessarily my perspective all the time. I, I will say, you know, I saw you, I think it was you at, at uh, Mark Ridley's Comedy Castle. My girlfriend yeah. is black, and, and yeah. she and her sister were there. She, they were the only black people in the audience. <laughs> um, at Mark Ridley's. At Mark uh-huh. Ridley's, which happens yeah, often, right? It does, uh-huh. you know? it does uh, yeah. And, and uh, she would describe how there were some jokes where everybody <laughs> would look at them to sort of <laughs> to see, see their reaction. if it was okay to laugh, and then when they saw the, that they laughed. And, and they were and, like, okay. Right, she loves okay, she, cool. she had to explain some of your jokes to me. <laughs> which is just interesting because... Because it's like, I, they're not. I, I think I always find it funny when people look at the black people to laugh because I understand that when somebody's saying like an actual racist joke, right? Where the punchline is, I'm racist, like right. that's belittling somebody. That's, yeah, yeah. Yes. when they're actually talking down about something. But if it's just in reference to a, that, Cultural. shows me the the sensitivity sometimes of, of 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 how sensitive race can be as a topic. When I'm like, no, I'm just mention. This is just a story of me and my friends, and race plays a factor in the story. But but nothing racist was said, guys. Just relax. Right, trust exactly. me. I'm not just mentioning that I had a black friend next to me in this story just to try just to sound throw that cool. In. All right. right? Like right. this is it's I promise you that it's related to the story, but it's also not racist. We can all let's wait to the end of this. And uh Okay, I'm sorry. I was gonna say I've had to get better at making the off- audience comfortable in the beginning of the joke. Mm-hmm. Um, or knowing when they're going to feel uncomfortable so I don't overreact too. If they get uncomfortable mm. and then I That's wasn't expecting point. that in the beginning of certain jokes when I wasn't used to them feeling uncomfortable, then maybe I would overreact where now I'm like, well, yeah, of course you guys are feeling uncomfortable. In addition to the race stuff and, 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 and the uncomfortability, I guess, what are some other or one or two other lessons that you've learned as you've become more and more successful and grown as a comic? What is something that e- either you've learned or you would advise an inspiring comic to, to think about in their routine? Um, f- for me, well, I guess uh, not necessarily. Uh, this wouldn't really, I guess, be advice for like uh, my routine as much, but just as uh, an outlook is that is to. J- Sometimes being happy takes effort, and I think some people mm-hmm. just think that it's just a reflection of whatever happened to you in life, where you you can be nice. You should just be nice to people. Like it's I know it sounds cheesy and it sounds easy, but so many times I see people think that there's a there's only X amount of opportunities that exist, and the bottom line is there's enough opportunities for everybody, but we just can't all do everything. So it's like, you know, I, I'm i sure there was a time when I, I was jealous that there was somebody that he featured at Mark Ridley's um, really early in his career. I had to, I hosted at Mark Ridley's seven times before I featured, you know. So if, if, so my, my instincts was to be like, how did he do that? And then I was like, well, I don't know, good for him. He's a nice guy, whatever, who cares? It's not, 
I did not get booked because he did. You know what I mean? Like right. there's the, so I think sometimes comedians, even though it's an individual, you're the only one on stage. I think sometimes we view it overly competitive where not everybody can do every show. Not everybody can, can be liked equally from every booker. Uh, so just if you're not having fun doing it, then you should you should have picked a different profession. I'm glad to hear you say that because <laughs> yeah. we've had a number of comics on the show, and whenever your name has come up, the first thing out of everybody's mouth is, well, the first two things are, one, he's really funny, and two, <laughs> he's, he's so just the nice. nicest guy in the world. <laughs> yes. So well, thanks, I'm glad you yeah. say that because that kind of backs up what everybody's been saying about yeah, you. Thank you. Yeah, uh, and yeah. I've heard some of those, you know, uh, I've, I've, I've seen some of the other episodes where people have said nice things, and, you know, Heather J had some really nice yes, things to say about me. That's what I was thinking of, yeah. Yes, and, uh, yeah. And I, I appreciate that, you know, and I, I could say the same thing about her and, and a lot of the other comics, which is why I'm happy to be in this in the Detroit comedy scene, because when I was filming the special uh, the for, for the next level, um, these comics were all great that were on the show, and I'm happy that I met them, but it was just interesting hearing them talk about how... Th- it's going to be perceived when they find out what they did and oh the comics in chicago are going to be hating on me because you know and i'm like wow i've gotten texts from comics i haven't talked to in two years saying congrats we live in a different community i guess you know so it does remind me that uh we are in a positive community uh the comedy community seems to be very supportive um in the, the detroit and metro detroit area you mentioned Mark Ridley's Comedy Castle, and I know that you've now headlined there two years in a row, right? Yep. Can mm-hmm. you talk about what that means for a local comedian? Yeah, it's it's. I mean, Mark Mark Ridley uh, is is being is credited as being the inventor of like the standard club uh, show length and setup, mm-hmm. where a, a host does fifteen minutes, and then a feature goes up, and then they do 20 to 25 and then the headliner does 45 to an hour like that that blocking is uh, credited to Mark Ridley you know there's other places where like in Canada and just in other pl- places in the world where the host will do is the most important person on the show and does jokes between and stuff so I think of him just Mark Ridley kind of almost being like a pioneer in that way and uh, his opinion means a lot to other people in the country. You know, he's helped comics get into Montreal. He, his word, you know, he, he helps, you know, uh, his opinion means a lot to, to important, uh, other people that are of importance in comedy. So him to book a comedian locally, uh, it means a lot because he doesn't have to, right. <laughs> there's, right. there's an interest enough to work that club that he's not booking it just off of who can sell the most tickets. You know, he puts together a whole show and he he puts thought into it of who can pair, who would be a good host for this headliner and vice versa. And uh, I think anytime that somebody appreciates something that I do, if they the more serious they take what they do, the the better I feel about it. You know, if somebody books me for a show and they don't care, they're just picking people at random that commented on their Facebook status like how excited am I going to be about doing that show versus right. uh, versus somebody that they book the entire year in advance, you know, at, in about a, in, a, in a week or so, in a, in a couple of weeks, he's going to start booking the entire next year. Explain so, that process. <laughs> being yeah, a What happens that. in September? So at yeah, the, the end of August, the first week of, uh, you know, people start emailing him the end of August. <laughs> and then the first week of September, um, he starts the booking process where he books the headliners first. Um, and then kind of works from there to book the, the rest of the comedians. It's like a fantasy football draft. Yeah. 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 So sometimes yeah. I don't know. So sometimes I don't know who I'm working with until I talk to the local yeah. comics and then hear because if, if now that I'm, I've, I've just now been lucky enough to start headlining, I, you know, at first when I was hosting, he would say, oh, you're working with this feature and this headliner. And now I'm like, I don't know who I'm working with. We haven't found out yet. But uh, just the amount of effort that he takes into it uh, means a lot, especially because he he's a nice guy. He's a genuinely nice guy. Where you can't say that about every club owner. I right? There's imagine. definitely a lot of club owners that do it because they're like, it's a cool thing to do. It's like a party, free drinks, whatever. Right. And then you see how long their club lasts when they treat it uh, that way. Where he's uh, a, just a genuinely nice guy. So it uh, it means a lot. He watches one show of every every week. 
he watches a show. I've heard that about him because he's got really a camera cool. there. He's got yeah. a camera Showing there, him. and it goes to and it's like a can and, and he can watch it. Yeah, um, it streams over to him. So he's he's not just taking other people's word for it 100 percent of the time. You know, he's putting his own effort into this business, um, and it and it and I think and I think it shows. So it, it definitely. Uh, you know, I just now found. I just now saw my headshot on the wall recently, and that ah, that was a cool feeling. Feel Thank good. You. That's yeah. got to be a weird feeling, doesn't yeah. it? There's yeah, there's me. Yeah, 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 exactly. That is a, it's a, it's a, it is a weird feeling where you're like, you're really happy to see it, and then at the same time, you're like, this, what, what? Come on, what are we doing? <laughs> 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 Look at all these famous people here. Yeah, why, right. why is why my head I, on the wall? Right. What is that? That's silly. <laughs> You know, oh. uh, <laughs> so I want to ask you, Jeff, on uh-huh. your regular day to day life, uh-huh. you know, you get invited to a party, you go to a friend's mm-hmm. house for dinner. Like, does everyone expect you to be funny all the time? Now, more so people expect when I started, though, people didn't expect me to be funny um, because I was only funny to people next to me. I was. Yeah, I was when I was growing up, I was very shy. I failed the first speech class I ever took. Huh. Well, that's um, me too. Oh, and yeah. uh, and I love my speech teacher for my senior year. I got the same speech teacher. I didn't need that credit to graduate. I could have easily. I probably was going to try to switch it. And oh, she, I'm sure you. I were. wanted yeah. to. And then she was like, "Just so you know, Jeff, you're 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 a different person than you were four years ago. Do it. And if you switch this class, I will go back to the counselor and tell them to switch it back. I just want you to know, like, huh. because mm-hmm. I know she that in you. you're not somebody that's just looking at the ground. You don't have any crazy issues that like you're just." You just you need to look past it because that that's the weird thing about uh, uh, is s- speech in general is that I think it's helpful to everybody because it shows you that people really don't care about you as much as you think they do. Correct. Like but the whole time you're, I was worrying like what are people thinking about me? And in reality, they're worried about their Themself. speech they're going to give. Yes. You know what I mean? Like they're the they're nobody's even if you do bad on stage, they, they don't. They're not going to go home and, you know, the average person <laughs> isn't going to write a blog about how awful your performance was. They're like, all right, let's go get a bite to eat. That was a, right. that was a bust. <laughs> Whatever. <laughs> exactly. You know, so it's, exactly. I definitely think public speaking people, uh, I don't, I didn't realize that until afterwards being more comfortable at it, uh, just how crazy it is that we just, we overly think about worrying about what other people think. And I'm pretty sure I went on a tangent and forgot what you asked. <laughs> Hopefully I answered your question. If people expect you to be funny. People expect me to be funny, In your regular yes. life. Uh, I was the uh, best man in um, in my, my best friend's uh, wedding. And it was funny because everyone was like, oh, this is a speech. And I'm like, I've known this kid since like we were both in diapers. Like, why can't I just... Be a love, friend. Love him and yeah. be happy that he's he loves a woman and they're getting married. Yeah. Why do I have to... Why is that? So it was like a mixture of both because mm-hmm. obviously I have inside stories since I knew him for so long. Yeah, but uh, it was just funny that every single person was like, "Oh, the comedian's giving a speech. It's going to be gonna hilarious." Be funny. Yeah, and I'm like, w- w-, you know, and I, I had to follow the the maid of honor. She gave uh, her speech that was kind of hard to follow. She did "Ice Ice Baby," oh. and she uh, changed you know she changed the words to fit their relationship. That's cool. And wow. she didn't just do. Until the chorus, like the, it starts the chorus. It, it didn't just until the chorus hit again. She didn't just be like, she did All the right. whole thing. She did the whole thing. So then yeah. after the chorus again, people are like, wait, she's still going? She still wrote more lyrics <laughs> to this? This is. Uh, so I was like, oh, wow, now I have to follow somebody too. Now yeah. it's not just. But is that because your normal process is to work out material over time in front of audiences? And this is a case where you can't do that? You can't do yeah, that. I think it was because it was like, I didn't want to overly prepare because to me, I always felt like that was silly. Anytime somebody has a. Like. When the president talks, when anybody talks, when I'm like, it's there's certain things where I'm like, why did you prepare for that? This is just say how you felt about it, right? You yeah, know? from the heart. Like this yeah. is a person that you've known your whole life. Just just say how you feel. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Like why? Did, but uh, but then then I think of it from the other perspective, and then I'm like, okay, well, I do. You know, they spent a lot of money on this wedding, so I guess I can't bomb, right? <laughs> like I should, I should. They're recording it. They're, they're gonna watch it for some, years. Yeah, I should put some thought into effort into what I'm saying and make it reflect you know, how I really feel and not kick myself afterwards yeah. for wishing I said other things. So, yeah. yeah. I, uh, coming up in September, September 20th, that's oh, a yeah. Thursday, you're going to be at the Sanctuary in Hamtramck as part of the Motor City Comedy Festival with the yes. Motown Laugh Kings. Tell us who the Motown Laugh Kings are. The Motown Laugh Kings are uh, three friends of mine who we started a comedy group 
Um, Ron Taylor was the uh, the the it was his idea, whatever that word is. I need to read a dictionary more. Um, he was the, the originator, is what I was trying to think okay. of, of the Motown Lab <laughs> Kings, and. Um, I was good friends with him. Actually, Ron was one of the first comics that I was friends with when I started comedy. Uh, I met him at a place called, at the time it was called Club Bart on, uh, in, in Ferndale. And uh, he told me, he's, he's, a, uh, he, he's a black comedian. He told me where the white rooms are, and I told him where the black rooms are. <laughs> that was, uh, we, st- <laughs> we were both maybe six months or so into comedy at the time, and I was like, well, this is my findings. Mm-hmm. And then he was like, this is what I found out. Interesting. And, uh, so we, we've kind of been friends for the you know the entire times the, of our in, entire comedy careers, uh, where, and then we then we met Josh and then we met Darius and uh, we just you know we've always gotten along together really well and we kind of thought that we complemented each other uh, in doing comedy so uh, we tried to kind of to brand that as a uh, as a group doing comedy and uh, it's also cool especially now Ron and Darius uh, both live in LA but um, you know all of us are, are having our own accomplishments separately so it's cool to see uh, to, to, to see us grow individually um, as that could only help us as a group if uh, of eventually you know we all live in the same place and can do that well it kind of is your theory about just being kind being a nice person but yeah. also building connections with people it wasn't yeah, you right. versus them it was like let's yeah. let's do this yeah like, it, it wasn't like a making the band situation right. where it was <laughs> like all right who are the funniest people in this room and I'm, I'm going to associate. befriend them and, yeah. and ju- it was yeah we, we were friends first so mm-hmm. it just makes it a lot but easier you to weren't Danity Kane yeah, yeah. Uh-huh. <laughs> do you have a deal in place like whoever lands a sitcom first has to invite the other guys to be oh, not, not a not a deal, but I mean, but yeah, but I, I, I'd beat up Ron. I, I, I'd yeah. absolute, if Ron didn't try and throw his name out there, oh yeah, yeah, no, yeah, I don't, I don't think we'll be friends anymore. I don't think, uh, no, <laughs> no, no, I uh, we don't have like an exact uh, deal, but I, I just think that we're good enough friends where that would just kind of be assumed. Where yes. we've always tried to give opportunities to uh and luckily we all are individually funny too so that kind of worked out to where i'm not <laughs> just important. i'm not just throwing a bone to a friend of mine if i can't do a show and i recommend another comic i'm recommending you know josh adams is one of the funniest comics oh you'll ever God. see i haven't so, seen ron and darius because so, they're out in la but josh adams yeah, is so, hilarious. so hilarious if i can't yeah, do it so you, you know i have to i have to kind of sometimes really reassure somebody that it's like I know that you wanted to book me for the show I'm sorry I'm booked but I'm, I'm I can I can read his bio too if you want yeah. but you know he's been on BET he's been on Fox Laughs he's won every competition he's entered he's yeah. he can stand on his own as well mm-hmm. and uh, and so that is like a, an extra benefit <laughs> as well is when you when you got funny friends then you don't feel like a bad person yeah, for that's just awesome. uh, <laughs> so now that you're on television I mean did the crowds change are there women throwing bras on stage to you <laughs> yeah, or anything what, like we, that what's yeah. happening the, nobody no, nobody's throwing any bras uh, uh, just luckily. panties <laughs> <laughs> just <Yeah>. pennies. <laughs> um, uh, it, it is funny when um, this happened before I uh, had w- had any TV credits. But it is funny how some people just think that compliments aren't heckles. Where like I loudly heard uh, a woman in the audience say that she thought that I was cute, and I was like, "That that's great." But I know you think I'm cute. I think you're an awful audience member. I just want you to know that. I, 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 my opinion on you is not judged on any flattery that I can receive. It's, it's you knowing how to act in public. And you're not doing it. You're not, you're not doing, doing it right now. So, uh, <laughs> so I don't know how everybody handles that situation, but you know. Uh, that's how I handle it. And so, then she's like, well, so fine, somebody, you're yeah, not that threw, cute. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> it's like if somebody threw a bra at me, I would just be like this. I'm not telling a joke about bras right now. That All you're doing no is sense. being, this doesn't help me. This doesn't help me. I don't know what you thought I was going to do with that. But yeah, so, so now it, there's just dirty clothing on, <laughs> on the stage right now. Interestingly enough, so our, our, our intern Marvin looked you up on YouTube earlier. <laughs> and the first uh, thing that popped up on YouTube was something else being thrown on the stage. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Somebody uh, threw a dildo. Somebody threw a dildo at me. Okay, you want to ex- yeah, uh, yeah. Uh, uh, set the I, scene for us? Were you so telling a joke about I was a in, dildo? No, I was in Grand Rapids, and I was at Dr. Grin's Comedy Club. Great comedy club. I was happy to be there. 
and I was just recording my set just because I realized, you know what, I don't record my sets as much as I should, and why did I buy a camera? I might as well use it. So I was recording my sets the whole weekend, <laughs> and then uh, for this show, I think this was the early Friday show. The early Friday show. Not even the late The late shows when they're generally drunk. Yeah, yeah, not even the late. Like, you know, yeah, yeah. The, and there was literally five bridal parties at this one show, huh. which is Oof. insane. Like, that's odd. That's the red that parties? Is, the, yeah. huh, yes, bachelor oh, right. parties. Oh, wow. Yeah, 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 yeah. Sorry. And um, which is an insane, you don't get one every show, let alone five. Yeah. Now, two of them were not, three of them were well behaved. I didn't even <laughs> know that they were there until afterwards when somebody was like, you know, the, and they pointed them out. But, uh, because uh, I actually I had two things thrown at me, one of which was a dildo, and mm-hmm. then later on somebody th- uh, I tried to get into my next joke after I handled it, and then somebody threw some purple beads at me, which didn't get as much of a response because they're just normal beads, and you can't stop the dildo being thrown no. at me. So at that point, it was just somebody trying to be funny after the funniest thing was said. It was like ah, stop. Trying. So flat, how do you flat. how did so, you handle so, that situation? So. Uh, I could tell that since most of the audience was was from these parties, that anytime I did any sexually related joke, they were not on board, or they they were on board for the sexual jokes, but any joke about just a, a story of me and my grandpa, they're like, no, that's, <laughs> we don't care. Whatever. You, you, you kidding me? We don't want to hear that. Will you call an audible in that situation and and, so, yeah, and, and so, change the material a little bit? Yeah, on so, the fly? yeah sometimes yeah. I'll, I'll kind of like change the order of it. You know, like if I I could bring the dirty stuff earlier on in the set instead mm-hmm. of doing it later, which is what I typically would kind of do. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I like to establish that everybody thinks I'm funny before I like before start into the, yep. the stuff that some people think is more of a shock. Mm-hmm. And but I uh, so I just made a joke of like you know I haven't I haven't you know I haven't said any sexual jokes in in 30 seconds and you guys are going crazy and you know you guys are upset about it and then a lady waved a dildo at me uh-huh. from the crowd and then Over i here. pointed that out and said that it's it's weird cuz it's 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 very flimsy <laughs> I do, I thought that the whole purpose was it for it to be. I, I don't know why you would want a limp dildo. Right, like, I don't right. Know, it <laughs> seems that to be. I have no idea why that would be uh, would be appealing That's to unusual you. Unusual. Maybe yeah. I don't understand yeah. the female anatomy as well as I as I thought, thought. I did. But I, I I'm confused. So I, I made some jokes like that for a while, and then uh, and she then she threw it at me. <laughs> And uh, yeah, in hindsight, I always wish that I like just caught it in midair. Oh. The crowd would have went crazy if I just caught yes. it and was like, ah, I don't know. Ah. I just held it up like a sword, like I just conquered by the cow power of gray skull. Yeah. Kind of thing. King yeah. Arthur, yeah, some King Arthur style. Yeah, I wish I would have just had the presence of mind to do that. Instead, I was like, look, I'm not. Uh, you know, I'm not not touching it. I, th- I remember saying this that I'm not not touching it for any homophobic reasons. I just don't know where it's been. Oh. <laughs> you know, like I, it's just so we understand why I'm not touching this thing. Mm-hmm. And uh, it was just sitting on the stage for a while, and and the headliner actually gave it back to her afterwards, uh, uh, or during her show, she just threw it back at her. I was gonna <laughs> wait for her. I tried to set it up like. Like uh, you got your phone taken in class, you don't get it after class. You get it at the Ooh, end of the school day. Right. That was the example right. that I gave. Where I was like, I'm not giving this back to you. You don't I hope deserve it. You yet. don't deserve this yet. Mm. Act right, and maybe we'll see what happens. But uh, the headliner was like, Ah, just whatever. I don't want to perform with this on the stage. <laughs> <laughs> I don't like looking at. I don't this. like looking at this. This is distracting. So then um, afterwards, she came up to me, and then she said, "I'm sorry that I threw that at you. In the moment, it just felt right." <laughs> And that was her justification for it. Oh. This is where it gets even weirder. So her the 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 bride, the the woman actually getting married, she told me that she uh she makes dildos for a living. Oh. That's what she does for a living. Okay. So in her basement, her she makes them. She That's sculpts, her yep. she like oh, contributes real income. She's yeah. not like it's not a hobby of hers. Yeah. And she gave her friend that one because she just didn't like the way it turned out. Like it had a, an uh, imperfection. Like, like maybe it was too limp or something. Right. Or, yes. I don't know. That makes but sense. she just didn't like it. So she was like she but you I'm can like, have it. But I'm like, what a an awful friend. I'm like, you make them for a living? Give her a good one that you yeah, like. Right. What are you like? This Especially is my her. favorite one. You're in my wedding? You're standing up in my this wedding? This is for your bachelorette this party. Is, You're going to walk around town with this thing. Exactly. That is yeah, so I, strange. I, I, yeah, I thought that that was insane. We've established that there's not a lot going on in Grand Rapids. That's what people are doing in their basements. <laughs> 
<laughs> well, Jeff Horse, congratulations on the show. I mean, it's really Thank amazing. You. It is Kevin Hart Presents The Next Level. It is airing uh, this Friday, which will be tomorrow, tomorrow by the time you hear this. I can't wait to see it. Uh, at 11 on Comedy Central. And there's a there's a viewing party that you're hosting as well, right? Yeah, yeah. I'll be at Zeke's Barbecue uh, in Ferndale. Oh, it's yeah. on Nine Mile, just west of Woodward. Mm-hmm. And uh, I'll be there as early as 9 o'clock. Uh, it airs at 11, but if anybody wants to stop by, it, you know, it doesn't cost any money. It's just a, uh, a good barbecue bar restaurant. And uh, yeah, August 24th, it airs at 11. And if you want to uh, watch it online, you can watch it online on Comedy Central's website, of course, uh, or on their app. So there's there's options if you can't make it to the viewing party. And uh, if people want to follow you on social media or find out where you're performing next, how can they do that? Uh, JeffHorstComedy.com okay. is my website. And then okay. I also mentioned my dates on my Facebook page and Instagram and Twitter and uh, all of that. You can find me just at, at Jeff Horst. And H-O-R- spell your name for us. Yep. Uh, H-O-R-S-T-E. So it's a Jeff H O R S T E comedy dot com um, or just Jeff Horst on any social media platform. Awesome, Jeff. Well, congratulations and thanks so yes, much for stopping by. This has been you. awesome. So fun. Thank you. Appreciate you guys. The D Brief, your guide to Detroit's arts and entertainment scene.